Welcome to Westpac's webinar on medical device package testing, common test failure modes, and solutions. I'm Greg Swinghammer. I'll be your moderator and webinar organizer today. Before we get started, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. First, you should have the control panel on your screen, and you can minimize this panel by clicking on the orange arrow button in the upper left-hand corner. You may expand the panel by clicking on the same button. Secondly, you have the ability to submit questions using the chat pane located near the bottom of the control panel. We will be answering a few questions during the webinar. However, if we are unable to address all your questions during the webinar, one of our presenters will follow up with you via email afterwards. Today's webinar and video slide deck should be available on the Westpac's website by Monday. With that, let's get started. Today's presenters are Herb Schunemann and Katie Tran. Herb is the founder and chairman of the board of Westpac and a past lecturer at nearby San Jose State University. Katie is a lab manager here at Westpac and has been with us for over 10 years. In April, she gave a similar presentation at the Q1 conference in Maryland. Katie, you're our first presenter. Take it away. Thanks, Greg. Hi, we will be talking about medical device package testing, common test failure modes, and solution. At a testing laboratory, we see so many package configurations, failures, and fixes. We'd like to share a tiny portion of what we see and do. Before we start, Herb, would you like to say something? Sure would, Katie. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar on um, medical device package uh, testing, showing, uh, highlighting common test failure modes and the solutions to those. We see these things often, and uh, we thought it best if, if the people who could benefit from them were aware of them in kind of a succinct format like this webinar. So we would like to uh, welcome you. We, we uh, certainly appreciate your feedback. And if you would take some time at the end of this uh, presentation to fill out the uh, evaluation forms, it helps us a lot in determining exactly how close we are to hitting the target in terms of what you really want to hear from us. So with that as an introduction, Katie, take it away. Before we get started, let's talk about the purpose of this presentation. We would like to share our collective knowledge and experience, help our customer avoid some frustration during package validation testing, save money, and of course, time. Before we begin, we want to talk about confidentiality. We sign non-disclosure agreement, NDA. And for those customers that we don't sign, we still maintain confidentiality. This is a very generic flowchart of the events that our customer encounter in order to launch their products. We know the journey is more complicated as outlined in these nine events. However, we just want to indicate where we, a testing laboratory, is located in the flowchart. So you send your packages to a testing laboratory to get your package validated. You get a phone call from your test engineer or an email saying the package were not able to sustain, failed to pass, there were gross leaks. You're not an expert testing or familiar with these phrases. So what do they all mean? No worries. We'll explain them to you in the next few slides. Before we get into the failures, Herb, what do you consider as a successful failures? Excellent question, uh, Katie. Um, and by that I mean just because the package failed doesn't mean that it's a Black Friday or anything else. Often you can learn as much or more from what we call a successful failure than a package that passes the test protocol all the time. Consider this. If a package passes all the time, you have no idea if it's over-designed by 200% or 500% or 1,000%. You just don't know. All you know is it passed. A failure, on the other hand, can tell you exactly where you are on that margin list, if you will, and you know exactly how much uh, more protection to add to the package. So don't consider a failure to be you know, the end of the world. It, uh, it might just be the, uh, a very good sign. Katie, back to you. Due to the limit time for the webinar and complexity of testing, we are narrowed down to four test inputs that our customer have failures. Please know that there are more test inputs and failures associated with them, but for the sake of time, we'll be talking about these four. Commonly observed test inputs with failures. The first one is drop testing, also known as manual handling. Second one is compression. Some people know the, known it as vehicle stacking. Third one is concentrated impact. 
forfeits gross leak detection, also known as bubble testing. These test inputs are listed in the order of testing. Herb, what is your opinion of these test inputs? Uh, these are often referred to as hazards in the distribution process. So uh, uh, not all of the distribution process is hazardous, but these elements certainly are hazardous. These are things that can, in fact, cause failure. So uh, based on that, it's necessary to uh, survive these hazards. It's not an option. Um, there, there will be a lot of time during distribution when the package is standing still, it's in storage, uh, it's at a stoplight, the truck driver is sleeping, who knows? Okay, those aren't hazards. You're still in distribution, but that's not a hazard. It's during the hazard elements of the distribution environment where damage is uh, possible, and that's what we're concentrating on here. Katie? Let's start with the first test input, drops, or manual handling. Drops are caused by human during a normal distribution environment, where the boxes are being handled. The ASTM standard is ASTM D5276. The latest revision is 1998 and it was reapproved in 2009. Herb, why is there a standard for drop testing? Good question. Uh, this uh, standard tells us how to run the test for consistency from test to test. It doesn't uh, tell us anything about the drop heights or the number of orientations of impacts, anything like that. It simply says that in order to do a competent or standard a drop test, uh, you must follow these certain procedures in order that uh, you have good consistency from one test to the next and you can actually then tell what was the cause of the issues. Katie? You're wondering where do you find drop tests or manual handling testing. It is part of package performance testing standards, like the ASTM D4169, ASTM D7386, or the ISTA series. Drop testing is a pass or fail criteria where the package system is able or not able to protect and keep the contents intact. Herb, what do these standards tell us? These standards, as opposed to the, the uh, drop test standard that we just looked at, tells us the intensity and or duration of the test. In the case of drop testing, the intensity would be the drop height. Uh, duration might be the number and or the orientation of the impact. So we use those two standards together. The 5276 says this is how you do a drop test. And then the 4169 and similar standards say this is how high you drop it and the number of times in the orientation. So that's how those two work together. Katie? Here we have a product Lilo from the Disney movie. She needs to be protected from a series of drop test sequences per the different test standard as Herb mentioned. She is placed on the drop tester as shown on the photo on the right. Herb, what do we need a drop test machine for? Can we just drop Lilo? Good question, Katie. A drop test machine is necessary to uh, meet the requirements for the flatness and the repeatability and the consistency of the drop testing from one uh, test to the next. If you think about it, who the heck needs a drop machine? Just give it to your kids. You know, they'll drop it uh, all, you know, who need, <laughs> why spend money on a drop test machine? But for consistency and repeatability, that's what we use. Katie? Here we have a drop test video for People who haven't been inside testing laboratory, here's a video where we drop Leo in the base down orientation. The drop height is 15 inches, which is assurance level 2 of ASTM D4169. After the drop test sequence per the standard, we have damage such as tape tearing or corner denting as indicated in this photo. These are common failures for drop testing. Here's another photo of a box. This type of damage is a common damage corner denting. Depends on your acceptance criteria. For a medical device industry customer, their primary concern is to ensure the primary package remains sterile. Herb, is this acceptable damage? Good question. Does the package have to be perfect at the destination? No dents, no punctures, no nothing. Remember that the environment that this uh, product is going into uh, is, is very fussy. Would you want your child to be operated on using a product that was shipped in that package? So even though 
uh, this may not cause any conceivable damage to the product. Uh, you have to be concerned about the condition of the package as well. People do make judgments about that, and there's no standard for it. But just be aware of that fact. And we'll tell you what, what you can do if that, uh, in the future if that causes a problem. Katie? Now you know what type of damage occurs during drop testing. Let's talk about simple fixes. The first simple fix is change the box to design. Here's a photo of a regular slotted container, RSC. If you can change the box style to a full overlap, FOL container, it will reduce the denting damage. This design reinforces the corners of the boxes. Herb, is the cost affected by this extra protection? Well, perhaps. The uh, full overlap container, as, as showed here, uh, increases the container cost about 20%, roughly, and may require a different uh, closure system. So there is a substantial cost associated with this uh, style of container over the full, the uh, regular slotted container. But if that solves the problem, it might be money worth, worth uh, money, money uh, that was well spent. So you have to evaluate these various fixes for their cost and their effectiveness. Katie? On the bottom of each box, there is a box manufacturer's certificate called BMC stamp. The BMC contains information on the box manufacturer, board strength, everything you need to know about the shipper material. The BMC can be in burst values, PSI, or edge crush, ECT. This BMC indicates the box is a single wall, 200 PSI board. To increase the compressive strength of the box, increase the board strength of the shipper. The photo in the middle right here is 200 75 PSI. You can also change it to a double wall or a corrugated insert could be used to reinforce the box. These inserts are placed on the vertical edge of the box as indicated in the photo. The vertical edge of the box is a structural support of the box. Herb, with these changes in the material, how much does it cost? <clears throat> Upgrading of the, uh, of the liner strength, uh, in other words, going from a 200 to a 275 uh, burst strength box will increase the cost about 8% or so. Uh, inserts in the corner will increase both the impact resistance and the compression strength. Uh, increasing the, the board liner will also increase the compression strength of the container as well. Uh, going to a double wall container may increase the uh, the cost uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 14 percent. And, and remember, these numbers are, are uh, changeable depending on your supplier and the time of year and maybe the phase of the moon, too. Who knows? Uh, but my point is that, that you there you have a lot of options to change the container system when you, you show a, in this particular case, drop test damage that you consider to be unacceptable. Katie? Another simple fix is reveal the conditioning profile. For example, ASTM D4332 has a list of different temperature and humidity conditions you can select. The standard does not indicate the order of these temperature and humidity conditions. If you end your conditioning profile with a tropical condition, which is 40 degrees C and 90% RH, the box will be saturated with water moisture. If you consider ending the profile with a desert condition, the box won't be dried, would be dried out, and with less moisture, that might help with drop testing. Herb, can you talk more about the tropical environment? Thanks, Katie. Uh, the, the tropical environment, uh, 40C and 90% RH, as Katie mentioned, um, greatly increases the board moisture content of corrugated paperboard and paper in general, for that matter. Uh, at uh, standard conditions, 23 degrees C and 50% RH, there is about a 7% by weight um, component of water in the typical paper structure. At uh, 40 degrees C and 90% RH, that increases almost four times. Uh, and since paper is a hydroscopic material, it will readily absorb this moisture. And when it does, the strength decreases, including the impact resistance that you are relying on for good drop test results. So you can either uh, re-evaluate whether or not that condition is necessary in your profile or the simplest thing as Katie mentioned is put it at the beginning of the profile rather than at the end. Okay, Katie? 
Last but not least, if the product isn't damaged when arriving to the end user customer and there are no field failures, then do nothing. Herb, can you tell us about false positive in testing? Sure can. Uh, we hear this a lot where you have uh, failures in the laboratory that are not duplicated by failures in the field. This doesn't mean that the test is lacking or has some components missing or is overly uh, problematic, things like that. Um, just remember that, that every time you ship something to the field, uh, there's a huge variability in, the, uh, in how it's going to be handled. Sometimes it's going to have get a very gentle ride, maybe most of the time, who knows. And every now and then it's going to get a killer, a whacker. In the laboratory, uh, we, we uh, are very consistent about what we do, so we t try to, to shoot for uh, what's referred to as the three sigma level, in other words, 99% of what is likely to occur. But we're still dealing in probabilities, so make sure that, that, uh, that you don't overlook the, the uh, possibility that a failure in the laboratory simply uh, is not indicative of what normally happens in the field. That does happen, and we refer to these as false positives. Katie? It looks like it will be a good time to stop for questions before moving into the next HES input. Do we have any questions? Uh, Katie, no, we do not have any questions at this time. Hi, everybody. This is Greg. Don't forget you have the ability to submit questions using the chat pane note located near the bottom of your um, GoToMeeting tool that you have open on your screen. So please feel free to send in questions, and we will answer them to the best of our ability. And if we can't answer them here, we'll follow up with you afterwards. Thanks. Back to you, Katie. Thanks. Let's get back to the webinar. The next test input we'll be talking about is compression. The ASTM standard is ASTM D642. The latest revision is 2015. This document is a standard test method for determining compressive resisting of shipping containers, components, and unit loads. Herb, why do we need a standard for compression? Good question. Aren't we just squeezing boxes, and why is it necessary to have a standard for that? And again, it's for consistency and repeatability from one test to the next. Um, my, uh, my kid can do a pretty good job of squeezing boxes, uh, but uh, we want to be able to do it consistently and repeatably from one test to the next, and that's why we have a standard for it. Katie? You're wondering where do you find the compression test? It is part of the package performance test standard listed in the ASTM D4169 or ASTM D7386 or the ISTA series. Compression is a pass or fail criteria where the package system is able or not able to sustain the calculated top load. If you're wondering what is the calculated top load, the top load is determined by the compression formula listed in each of the package performance test standard. Herb, what is the purpose of these standards? As before, Katie, the uh, uh, performance standards, such as the ones we're looking at, give the magnitude of the inputs, the orientations, and similar. Uh, they are the variables in that whole process. The uh, ASTM D642, for example, simply tells us how we do it, not how heavy or how, how much we squeeze. So this standard gives us the... Uh, the passing criteria and the orientations and things like that. The uh, previous standard just said this is how you do it. Katie? In the previous slides, we talked about the compression test input, how it is part of the package performance test standard, as her mentioned. Let's talk about the compression testing is conducted. The top flow is calculated using the formula associated with the test standard, as I mentioned. The top load is the minimum top load that the box needs to withstand, and the units are in pound force. Once the top load is calculating, calculated, the box is placed in a compression tester between two platens. The top load is applied onto the box using a constant rate of 0.5 inch per minute, which is known as a platen speed. The yellow arrow indicates the direction of force being applied to the box. Her, what's the purpose of a box? <laughs> Good question. One of the primary functions of a container, a box, if you will, is to allow for stacking uh, to reduce storage space. Think about it. If it wasn't in a box, you couldn't stack it. Also, most medical devices are not, uh, by their very design, load supporting. So if they're going to stack them up, the box has to take the load, not the device. Therefore, we need good compression strength in order to stack up boxes so that we don't 
uh, compression load our, our products, such as medical devices. Katie? Now you know how compression is conducted. You are probably have two questions. First, how does the box look when it fails compression? As indicated in the photo on the left, the box has crushing on the edges and corners. This box failed to sustain the calculated top load. The photo on the right is a graph of the compression failures. What does it mean the box failed compression? For this particular box, the minimum calculated top load that the box needed to sustain was 300 pound force. However, looking at the photo on the left and the right for the maximum top load the box was able to sustain was 264 pound force. So this box failed compression. Here's a photo of the compression damage to the box. Now you know how a compression failure looks like. Let's get started with simple fixes. Here's a photo of the box placed between the two platens, and the arrow indicates the direction the top load is being applied. Here's a photo of the flutes of the box. Pay attention to the flute direction of the box. The flutes are horizontal in relation to the force being applied. As a result, the flutes are not supporting the top load. The simple fix is to make the flutes vertical so it withstand the top load, parallel to the force. Another simple fix is change the box style. Here's a box of a regular slotted container, RSC box. If you change the box style to a row and lock front container, R-E-L-F container, this design reinforces the vertical edges of the box because of how it's reassembled, how it's assembled. With the vertical edge reinforced, the box will be able to withstand more compressive top load. Another box style is the bliss container, where the vertical edges and horizontal edges on the smallest faces are reinforced. Herb, can you elaborate, elaborate more on the Bliss box? Certainly, there's uh, many styles of the box other than the ones we've shown here. But Bliss boxes are probably the most economical way to uh, tailor the compression strength of a box to a given situation. Um, you see many produce boxes in this uh, configuration. Unfortunately, they require a, this Bliss box requires a special setup machine, and it has other drawbacks. The so-called uh, RELF, or roll and lock front container that you see there, uh, is also an excellent top load uh, compression uh, resistance container. But it's, it's pretty well limited to uh, containers that are pretty small in terms of their depth. And that's because of the basic design of the container. Again, what we're trying to get across is there's many fixes uh, in, within the, uh, the, the, the packaging world for uh, compression failure, so don't consider this to be the end of the world by any means. Katie? Just like for the drop test failures, the simple fixes are increase the board strength, change to a double wall, use corrugated inserts. Oftentimes, we have customers who are in such a rush to get their products to validate package validated and don't have time to order custom size box so they will use off-the-shelf boxes. The off-the-shelf boxes tend to have too much headspace and the box is not optimized for the product. What is headspace you're wondering? Headspace is space between the top of the product to the top of the box. Here's a photo of Despicable Me, Minion Dave. He wa You need to protect the Minion when it reaches his new home. Notice how much headspace he has. Now look at Minion Dave in a box with less headspace, a custom made box just for him. This is what you want. You want the box to take the top load, yet allow some of the top load to be sustained by the contents. Otherwise you spend a lot of money making the box stronger. Herb, can you talk more about load bearing? Sure enough, uh, I mentioned earlier that most medical devices uh, should not be considered as a load supporting in other words they shouldn't be considered as part of the, the load resisting member of a product package system but you know the that, that may not apply to all medical products who knows if you have a, 
a stout product that can withstand the top load. That's one of the easiest ways to what's referred to as load share uh, the top load between the product and the package system. So to be sure, check it out. You might uh, might be wasting money on uh, extra corrugated or extra board or extra inserts or different box style or whatever just to get the compression strength that you, you think you need uh, that might be available just by load sharing with the product. So check it out. Katie? Again, another, another simple fix is to reveal the condition profile that we mentioned earlier in for the drop testing. Tape style. Notice there's only one beam of tape on this box, and during compression, the flaps were being pushed outward, also known as buckling. If you change the way you tape your box by applying one middle beam, left and right edges forming the letter H will reinforce the box and minimize buckling during compression. Again, if the product isn't damaged when arriving to the end user, your customer, and there's no fuel failures, then do nothing. Again, let's pause for a moment for questions. Thanks, Katie. We do have a few questions here. Um, the first is, is 15 inches the standard distance for a drop test? The 15 inches drop high is for ASTM D4169 for assurance level 2. Within D4169, there are three assurance level 1, 2, and 3. So if you're doing assurance level 1 is 24 inches, assurance level 2 is 15 inches, assurance level 3 is 9 inches. Just remember that these assurance levels are selected by you guys, and the weight of your package will determine at what height they will be dropped at. So for example, if you have a very light box, it will drop at 24 inches if you're assurance level 1. But if your box exceeds 20 pounds and it goes to 21 pounds, it will be dropped at 21 inches. And that's per ASTM D4169. Great. Thanks, Katie. The next question is um, related to the BMC. What does the box weight mean? Is it measurable in pounds PSI? and pounds in PSI. For example, a 250 PSI double wall corrugated box was selected for our products. What does this mean? So the question was box weight. So when we say box weight is the gross weight of the box with the materials and the contents and that's in pounds. But I think the question is asking about the board strength. So let's ask Herb about the 250 pound double wall, what it means. Herb? Uh, that's a confusing, uh, often confusing issue for people not familiar with the uh, box maker certificate, the BMC. Uh, several numbers are on there. The first is the burst strength. This is uh, quite literally a test that was uh, used in the fabric industry uh, years ago, and uh, it, uh, it it actually it was is, is the amount of force necessary to poke your elbow through through the sleeve of your shirt. The paper industry picked it up, and it's called the Mullen Burst Test, and it's uh, it's the amount of force that uh, that you have to put behind a rubber diaphragm to push it through uh, a piece of paper or corrugated box material, and uh, so the the 200 pound uh, burst strength means it takes 200 pounds of pressure, 200 psi, to push that rubber diaphragm through the box. Uh, <laughs> kind of a crude test, but it's been around for a long, long time, over 100 years. Um, so there's a difference between that number and 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 what the uh, BMC, the box maker certificate, calls the gross weight, and that simply is a recommended maximum amount of weight to put in that container based on its materials. It's two different things. So the the uh, the first number, the burst strength, is simply the weight, or more correctly, the strength of the paper used in the box. Whereas the the number below it, maximum load, is the is the uh, maximum amount of weight. That's recommended for the container. I hope that helps clear it up. Greg, back to you. Thanks, Herb. Um, we got another question here. Should the compression force be applied on different faces of the boxes? If you're using ASTM D4169, it says you're supposed to test it to the most stable orientation. When you test it to the most stable orientation, you just lay the box in its most stable orientation and apply the top load onto it. For the ISTA standards and all the other one, depending on the 2A or the 1A series, it will dictate which 
uh, is your base orientation. So that varies. Let me add that uh, the this, this, this standard is really intended to say whatever uh, orientation the container is most likely to be stacked in is the one where it should be tested for its compression strength. Now, that, sometimes that's straightforward and sometimes it isn't. Uh, but uh, consider that it's the most uh, the orientation most likely to be stacked. Uh, Greg, back to you. Thanks, Herb. Um, we're going to get back to the webinar now here. So back to Katie. Thanks, everybody. The third test info we'll be talking about is concentrated impact. The ASTM standard for concentrated impact is ASTM D6344 with the latest revision of 2004. It was reapproved in 2009. This document is a standard test method for concentrated impact for transport packages. Herb, can you give us some background about this test input? Uh, yes, uh, Katie. Most of the kinds of packages that we're talking about uh, will at one point in their life be shipped via uh, expedited delivery. And uh, when that happens, uh, overnight delivery, things like that, Packages are handled through sorting facilities in a fashion that uh, resembles water going down a trough. Uh, when that occurs, uh, you can imagine that the corner of one box can easily wind up on a flat face of another box, easily causing a, a puncture. Um, and uh, and this, this process uh, is full of that kind of, of uh, interaction. And therefore, this procedure for uh, concentrated impacts was uh, uh, developed in order to help improve the resistance of containers to these so-called concentrated impacts. So it's a, it's a relatively recent uh, addition to the hazards of the 4169 and, and similar uh, package integrity tests. Uh, Katie? You're wondering how our concentrated impact conducted. You have a cylindrical mass called steel rod. This rod is placed in a guided tube where the box is placed at the bottom of the tube on the floor. The steel rod must travel either 32 inches or 36 inches before impacting the box. The travel di distance is dependent on the test standard. Herb, can you talk more about this test input? <laughs> it's a, a kind of funny because early versions of the standard referred to the cylindrical mass as a missile. Hmm. Apparently that term was not politically correct, so the common term now is the uh, cylindrical mass. Katie? The concentrated test input is listed in two package performance test standards, as we mentioned, ASTM D4169 and ASTM D7386. As we noted before, the standard for the uh, syndrical uh, impact test uh, simply dictates the correct uh, procedures, but then does not answer questions about the magnitude or the severity of the impacts, nor the number of impacts, nor their relative locations on the packages. All of those questions are answered by the actual performance standards. Katie? Here we have is a concentrated impact video. Herb, would you like to add anything as this video being played? Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a killer to me. As you can see, the cylindrical mass is impacting the box and it's puncturing through. You're wondering what does a concentrated impact failure look like? Here's a photo. The shipper wall is punctured by the concentrate impactor or missile, as Herb was mentioning. So again, would you want to use anything in a package that showed damage like this, regardless of whether the product itself was functional or not? Probably not. Here's a photo with the concentrated impactor removed. You can see the shipper and the carton walls are punctured, leaving the contents exposed. If you are using ASTM D4169, you're in luck. You can omit the concentrated impact test input if the box is a single wall corrugated fiberboard material with greater than or equal to 275 PSI or 44 ECT. So what does this all mean? Let's get started. 
Here we have a BMC stamp indicating it is 200 PSI. According to the standard, it needs concentrated impact. We have another BMC stamp. It's a single wall, 44 ECT. This does not require concentrated impact. Last but not least, this BMC stamp is a double wall. You can omit the concentrated impact test input. Her, what is the best resistance for puncture damage? The best resistance for puncture damage is a heavier weight paper on the corrugated liners, and that's exactly why the writers of the standard uh, selected uh, this, uh, this omission if you use a heavier weight paper. Katie? Other simple fixes are increase the bore strength, change to a double wall, use corrugated inserts, or do nothing since the product is in damage. It is time for another question and answer session. Thanks, Katie. Um, we do have a few more questions here. First one is, what assurance level is typically used when doing shipping validations for medical devices? Most of our customers will use assurance level one because it will have the most confidence and repeatability because it's more severe. So a lot of our customers will do assurance level one. There are some medical device industry customers that would do assurance level two. And from what I have seen, those are usually units that don't go inside a human body. Cool. Thanks, Kitty. Um, Herb, do you want to add anything to that? OK. Um, we do have a question here that I'm going to go ahead and answer. Uh, can you discuss sample sizing? If, if we can fit it in, we really don't have time to discuss it in depth here. We did talk about it back in September of 2014 in a webinar that Paul Congaldi and Herb Schuneman put on back then. So if you want to go back and listen to that one, it's available on our website. Um, so we do have one more question uh, people that says, we have seen boxes that are greater in, than 275 burst strength or 44 ECT fail the concentrated impact test. Um, why does the standard omit them? Do, do we know why? Well. I've never seen a 275 or greater test container fail that test. Um, are you sure you weren't using uh, kryptonite or something in that missile? <laughs> um, it, uh, and, and that's a good point. Uh, that missile is supposed to be made of a ferrous iron, which has a, a, a certain density. You make it out of nickel or something like that, which is about double the density, uh, it's going to have entirely different results. To be honest with you, I've, I've never seen a, uh, a 275 burst or greater container fail it. Um, I'd be a little suspicious about the, uh, I don't know, recycle content or, or the uh, uh, where that, that particular box material came from uh, because it shouldn't fail. Uh, that, that's uh, the, and the whole reason why the 275 burst or greater, 44 ECT or greater, are not subject to the test is that everyone got bored running them because nothing ever happened. So they said, okay, let's, uh, let's eliminate that particular procedure for heavier strength board. So I, that's, a, that's a new one on me. I, I've never seen that happen. Greg, back to you. Katie, do you have something to add for this? Of course. So I assume this particular audience is asking about the question is that he or she probably had field failures associated with them because in our webinar we talked about we don't do the concentrated impact for 275 PSI board strength or 44 ECT. So I think this is a field failure that he or she is experiencing so it could be something that happens in the real world that is unexpected because the energy that it's per the standard I believe is 3.2 joules that is what if we are testing it to when we drop the missile, as Herb mentioned, uh, traveling 32 inches or 36 inches. Cool. Thanks, Katie. Um, next question. Are there any recommendations for concentrated impact test performance on other packaging materials like stretch wrap? If you are using the ASTM D4169, that is for distribution cycle 3 or 13, that is meant for a box, and that's what we're talking about here. 
Based on that, you can omit the concentrated impact if you have the 275 PSI single wall or 44 ECT. However, if you're using ASTM D7386, and within that one, there is a pallet version of the testing, and that it requires that you do need to do concentrated impact, whether or not you have a stretch wrap or a board material or whatever number. So it is a requirement for that test standard. Let, let me add uh, that there are a number of puncture tests that are applicable to things other than corrugated paperboard, for example, or, or paper. Uh, so slow rate penetration test. There's a uh, there's a, a, a puncture test in uh, in TAPI, uh, the Technical Association of the Pulp and Paper Industry. So there's a number of different uh, test standards and procedures for films, uh, for paper, for paperboard, things like that. Uh, so this particular one is, is designed strictly for uh, shipping containers, corrugated shipping containers of a 200 pound or, or less strength material. So th don't think that's the only test or that's the only application of it. There's a, a variety of different tests available. Uh, Greg, back to you. Thanks, guys. Um, that's all the questions we have for now. Uh, but please keep sending them in. These are good questions, and we appreciate the discussion during the webinar. I think it makes it a little bit more lively and active. Uh, we'll have one more break at the end, and if we have more time, we'll answer some questions there. Back to you, Katie. The fourth and the last test info we'll talk about is the gross leak detection, also known as bubble testing. The standard is ASTM F2096 with the latest revision of 2011. This standard is to detect gross leak in packaging by internal personalization bubble testing. How is gross leak detection or bubble testing conducted? The package is placed, in this case, the pouch, is submerged under one inch of water. The package is inflated with air to a particular pressure level according to the standard. You're wondering how does a gross leak failure look like? As the package is inflated with air to a particular pressure, you're looking for a steady stream of bubbles. You see, as indicated in this photo, that is a gross leak. We have a bubble test video to give you an idea of what it looks like. This is a foil foil pouch with a 250 micron hole. As you can see, the bubbles are coming out in that area. It's a steady stream of bubble, and that is a gross leak. So let's get started with simple fixes. Don't fold your pouch. Here we have a pouch that's folded multiple times. This is a no-no. Most of the products we test have depth or height if folding is necessary, fold poly against poly. Here we have Minion Dave who needs to be sterilized when arriving to his new home. We need to fold the pouch to fit into the box. But folding Tyvek against Tyvek, exposing the poly side, this is not what is recommended. Here we have Minion Dave again with the pouch folded poly against poly. This is the recommended way. Remember that most porous materials uh, develop channel leaks as a result of uh, flexure from folding, especially if the uh, folding is extreme or uh, is subjected to high pressures. Uh, keep the folding to a minimum in order to reduce this incidence of gross leaks in uh, sterile barrier package systems. And this is primarily true for uh, those that are uh, sterilized with uh, ethylene oxide, and therefore uh, they, they must be porous. So. Porous materials and folding are not a good mix, as Katie mentioned. Katie? Another simple fix is reduce the pouch size, or find a pouch that fits the product just right. What is just right? According to ISO 16775, which is a guidance document to ISO 11607, says the product should be 75% of the inner surface area of the porous side of the package, if not specified by the manufacturer. Here we have a picture of the pouch being folded more than one time. However, it is folded poly against poly as recommended. When you open up this pouch, notice how much excess space there is. We have about three inches that we can remove. 
Hopefully, once you remove this three inches of extra material, the pouch won't need to be folded. Another simple fix for gross leak failure from bubble testing is increase the thickness of the poly material of the pouch. Just remember, thicker doesn't mean better because it becomes more brittle. So you need to find a balance of it. In addition, adding a biaxial nylon layer to provide puncture resistance will help. So sometimes it's also feasible to include a cushion, especially on either end of a very long container system, in order to reduce the pressure on the sterile barrier and allow it to pass the bubble leak test. So a long a cylindrical type product uh, it dropped on its end is going to concentrate that load on the uh, on the, the folds on the tieback on the end, for example. And uh, if you can uh, you can fix those problems by simply adding a, a cushion. We've seen that happen in the past. Probably not the best solution because that's a, a extra cost. But if if you need it, that certainly is one of the answers. Katie. Here we have Minion Dave again. Notice the shape and depth of him. He has a lot of curves, a lot of sharp edges. He'll be moving around in a pouch. So let's use a device card to restrict him from moving around inside the pouch. When you use a device card, make sure the sharp edges of the Minion are covered so they will not be, puncture, will not be puncturing the pouch. If you have a double sterile barrier system where you have the tray inside a pouch, shown here, check the tray for sharp edges and corners. Notice how this tray has two sharp corners that did indeed puncture the pouch. This is a tray with edges. Think about a tray with edges curved inward, not exposing to cut the pouch as indicated in this photo. Remember also that sharp corners and edges are the biggest single cause of sterile, sterile barrier breaches. Sooner or later, sharp edges win and flexible sterile barriers lose. So remember that when you're designing both your inner and outer pouches or any other portion of that container system. Katie? Another double sterile barrier package is a pouch within a pouch. In this photo, the edge of the inner pouch shifted into the seal of the outer pouch. And in this photo, the inner pouch is folded, which is sharp enough to puncture the poly side of the pouch. So check the edges of your inner pouches when you have a double sterile barrier pouch within a pouch. If you have many components, sharp areas on your product, High in depth, consider using a thermal form tray. We had Despicable Me and Minion Tim this time, packed in a tray to restrict him from moving around during shipment, which could cause a leak or hole in a sterile package. Remember that the trays are definitely more expensive than a, a tieback pouch, for example, but if they're properly done, the results are near bulletproof. So it's a, it's a good solution for a thorny kind of problem. Uh, and that is a thermoform tray with a uh, breathable uh, backing on it. Katie? We talked about how drops, compression, concentrated impact, and gross leak detection, bubble testing are conducted, as well as the common failures and simple fixes associated with them. These simple fixes may or may not apply to your specific package system, as every package system is unique. If you're dealing with some type of failures, please don't hesitate to call us. We're more than happy to go into details with you. We hope our presentation accomplished its purpose of sharing knowledge and experience, reduce frustration during testing, save time in the testing laboratory by applying these simple changes to achieve a successful package validation, and of course, save money by reducing the number of retests. Herb, would you like to add any closing remarks? Sure. Uh, uh, thanks, Katie. Medical device packages are probably subjected to more scrutiny than almost any other uh, large commodity package in, in the uh, realm of package engineering. So don't feel bad about the uh, occasional failures and uh, uh, changes in directions and all the nitpicking that goes into this. Uh, it is an extremely important uh, package system. It's got a lot of, a lot of very uh, uh, 
fussy people to satisfy, if you will. It's got a distribution environment that has to go through that uh, doesn't care that it's a medical device. So there, it, it's it's a very difficult uh, packaging requirement. But I think it's uh, it's something that's very doable. We hope that uh, these remarks and and some of the comments about the the things that we see in medical device packaging is helpful for future designs or or modifications and that uh, the, the more you do this the more the better you get so that uh, it's it's something that's that's uh, that's very achievable uh, and we certainly enjoy your comments about them and uh, your comments about our presentation today as well so good luck to you I hope this has been helpful uh, Katie do we have any more questions we have one final question and answer session um, thanks, everybody. This is Greg again. Uh, we do have a question here. Uh, gross leak testing versus dye penetration testing. Which one should be used and when? Gross leak detection testing or a bubble testing is a sterile barrier testing. So you're looking for leaks in the package. We're looking at the whole packaging material, the poly, the Tyvek, the tray, the seals. This is typical for the package validation that our customer do. Dye penetration testing is for seal integrity. It looks for channel leaks or voids in the seals. And that's usually done when you do IQ or QPQ of your sealer. Cool. Thanks, Katie. Um, so we're going to start wrapping things up here. Uh, Katie and Herb, thanks for that great presentation. Uh, our next webinar is the fifth in our Packaging Dynamics series. It's scheduled for Thursday, September 24th. You can check our website under the Resources tab and for more information, you can register there or wait for your personal invitation to arrive in your inbox. We have two locations, one in San Jose, California, and one in San Diego. If you missed anything or would like to listen to the webinar again, you can go to Westpac's website at www.westpac.com under the Resources and Webinar tab. The materials from this webinar should be uploaded by Monday. We will be sending out a short survey within a few hours. Um, please fill it out as we highly value your opinion regarding today's webinar. You also have the opportunity to ask more questions if you come up with any or if you think of any webinar topics you'd like to hear. Thank you for attending. I'm Greg Swinghammer. Make it a great day.